you know, overcomes my Jesus helps me overcome my struggle. That's a promise. I'll place nothing on you that's uh, too great for you. That's a promise. You know, uh, when you leave this earth, you can be assured of, if you've given your life to Christ, you can be assured of eternal life. That's a promise. Nothing compares in this world to the promise we have in Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. I'm going to make some announcements for you this morning. First thing i got to do is say congratulations on the building fund. I, you know, we announced one number last week. I think we announced something like 65 or $6,800 where we needed 63 and you see after they got in there and did a, a, a really detailed count of the money on Monday morning that there was more contribution than we realized and the final total for last week's building fund offering was $8,320. That's very good. Yeah. And what you need to do when you leave today, I know a lot of you like to come by, and I'm, I'm not going to tell you not to come by and shake my hand. I want you to come by and shake my hand, but I want you to see that front porch, too. How many of you have seen it? Isn't that beautiful? You know, and I can't wait till they come back, but hopefully this week or maybe early next week, and get the brand new, freshly sandblasted and painted handrails back up and scratch the... Uh, old paint off of the columns and repaint the columns. We will have a beautiful front entrance to our church. I can't wait to see it. You know, uh, and that to me, I'm going to tell you, it's just a symbol of what God is doing in our church. Such great things that God is doing right here in our church, calling people into ministry. Uh, people are giving their life to Christ. We're able to impact our community. We're doing something tonight called, uh, you know, we're beginning a discipleship training class. And listen, it's not just for new members. This is not a new members class. This is discipleship training class. How many disciples of Christ are there here this morning? Everybody's hand should be up. We're all disciples. Everybody's hand. There you go. Everybody here is a disciple. A disciple, a follower of Christ. And these classes are designed to help you become a better follower of Christ. And through our goal meetings earlier in the year, one of the things that kept recurring up is people said, we would like to participate in some of the secret church uh, material that, that we've seen online and some other churches are doing. And, and some of the, I participated in them and some of the other members have participated in them. And let me tell you something, the, the class that I took on secret church, this is material put together by David Platt, who pastors the church at Brook Hill in Alabama. And let me tell you something, you come to this class and it is like Bible college level material. It is solid, sound, biblical. It can't get any more biblical material. And, and it's for every believer. And, it's, and if you want to go home and do some study on David Platt, do that this afternoon. If you want to look up Secret Church online, see what it's all about, secretchurch.org, radical.net. You can look at these places and, and find out about what's going on with this secret church. You can even follow, if you want to go a little further, dig online and click and watch some of the sessions that we'll be begin our study with called The Body of Christ. You know, he's got a, a dozen series in Secret Church that he's done. We, I feel led to lead us in the body of Christ first, and then we'll, we'll go from there. But I want you to come and participate. And, what you know, it's set up that these programs will last from like 6 in the evening till midnight. Of course, we're not going to do that this afternoon. That's not how we're going to utilize the material. We're going to take it in hour bites at a time. And what we can cover in an hour, we'll cover. And we'll provide the workbooks. We've got workbooks already printed up. They're nice. They're, they're uh, I wish I had one in here to show you. They're, they're about this thick to take all your notes in. They're bound and in, in, a, in a plastic binder. They've got a laminated cover. They're nice, nice material for you to use to learn about the body of Christ. And it's for everybody. So I hope you'll make a commitment to come and start that. This afternoon, if you'll be here by 445, here in the sanctuary, the program's already loaded, we're ready to go, we're excited about this, and we'll have a wonderful time in discipleship training with David Platt, Secret Church, the body of Christ. I gotta tell you that uh, Monday night, we... You know, when we started Celebrate Recovery, we opened our doors up. We didn't fully know what to expect, you know, we, whether it be the, the folks who've been faithful to come to training. We've had five or six who've been faithful every week to come to be trained. And I didn't know if it'd just be me and my people I've been training to do Celebrate Recovery. 
But guess what? This past week, on our very first night, we had two of our church members who were in recovery and three people from the community that we met for the very first time here who are in recovery. We had five guests participate in our very first night of Celebrate Recovery. And then I, I believe God is going to use Celebrate Recovery to help people and to encourage people. Let me tell you something about Celebrate Recovery. They emphasize in all their material. Celebrate Recovery is not just for people who are recovering from alcohol addiction or drug addiction or gambling addiction or a porn addiction. It's for somebody who, you know, he says, that if you're dealing with a hurt, a hang-up, or a bad habit in your life, you can benefit greatly from Celebrate Recovery. And for the five or six weeks of material that we've already reviewed, I'm going to say that's the true fact, Jack. You can. And how many of you that are here tonight would say, I have a hurt, a hang-up, or a habit? You know, you're invited to celebrate recovery and, and just participate in the worship time and the fellowship time and the refreshment time. We have a refreshment time for everybody. And then the uh, small group session, Monday nights from 6 to 7.30. It's really a discipleship program as well. Remember First Kids on Wednesday, we've been having great turnout. Workers have been great, faithful, showing up, getting good reports from Miss Karen. Continue to pray for First Kids meets on Wednesday night. Prayer meeting meets on Wednesday night. I want to commend you. We've had some better attendances in the last few weeks. We've been talking about the topic of forgiveness. You know, uh, if you wouldn't like to continue in that discussion with us. We'll be on that uh, topic for a while longer. Um, uh, Thursday morning, 10 o'clock, ladies time out. You can begin the Bible study this week on the 26th. Is that next week? Why don't you take just a minute to explain? Yeah, go ahead. For real? It's announcement time. Oh, okay. Eight-week study? Six-week study? Okay. You'll have it ready next week. Okay. All right. Friday morning, uh, Friday afternoon, rather, Brother Blair and I will be leaving for Montana this time. I don't know about this time. I get time a few zones confused, but uh, I'll, I'll be preaching at a church plant in Montana, Helena, Montana. And I'm excited about that opportunity to encourage a young church just three years old and how they might impact their community for Christ. So pray for me next Sunday as I have that opportunity. Pray for Brother Blair four nights uh, beginning next Monday. He'll be teaching at Yellowstone Bible Institute. And the both of us together will be assisting a pastor as he tries to uh, lead his church to grow a community into Christ and and uh, we'll also begin praying about a vision of how our Western Kentucky Baptist Association might be able to partner with a church there in Helena, Montana, to reach their community for Christ. So next Sunday morning, I'll be away. And, you know, I need you to pray for Danny. Danny was scheduled to preach for us next week. You know, Danny's got a lot on his plate right now with his situation with his mom. And I'm going to encourage him to... Uh, spend this week with his family and not worry about preparing for sermons and and such as that. And uh, you know, his, his uh, it's been a long week already for the family. And and uh, I'd like you to enjoy. I like for you to join me in praying for Miss Maggie. And praying for uh, is it your, your grandpa's name's Jake, Jake and Jacob and Colton and Karen and. Danny and Steve, and I don't remember Steve's wife's name, Renee, and their family is, you know, they set side, they're sitting side by side with their mom for now for almost a week uh, as she is definitely in her last hours of life. Let's pray for her home going to be peaceful. That's what we benefit and pray for the family as they deal with this situation, difficult situation. So what I've asked uh, this week is next week, um, things will be a little different. Dallas will be away at a, a mass walk. And 
So Bobby's going to lead our worship, you know, so that'll be a little different spin on things, won't it? Bob's going to get, Bob always does this. You ever notice when Bob leading music, he gets up on his tiptoes? <laughs> I noticed that. Bob gets excited, and I love it when Bob does that. So Bob will be up here, and he'll sing, and, and then uh, he'll lead us in our worship. And then Ben Wilson will bring our Sunday morning message. Yeah, Kim just went, huh? <laughs> you know, uh, I asked Ben this morning, I said, Ben, how would you like to preach next Sunday morning? He said, you know, Pastor, I was already going to ask you if I could have another opportunity. I've been working on a text, and he showed me his text. It's a challenging text from the Old Testament. So I'm, I think you should make plans to be here, encourage Ben. He's a fine dude, you know, to take on this responsibility. He feels called to ministry, give him an opportunity to shine. Then on the 29th, we'll celebrate baptism. We've got a whole long list of folks who are going to be celebrating believers' baptism. And then uh, we also on the 29th need to have a special called business meeting last Sunday night of this month. And what that business meeting is about is that we're going to take a look at the International Mission Board's membership, church membership policy. And there's some things in that policy some details of that policy that would, could really benefit our church. And we'll ask you, uh, you know, deacons have prayerfully looked at this for a long time, Cons and looked at this closely and carefully and prayerfully, and we're going to bring that before you to the church for discussion and perhaps adopt the IMB membership policy for churches, and we'll do that on the 29th. And then remember October 6th, we're going to have worship at the park. Okay, now we've invited Green Valley, and I've not got an official word back whether they're going to be able to attend or not. But we look and hope for to have them come and lead us in, in music that day. So that's a lot of announcements, and most of that stuff's in your bulletin. and you'll be reviewed. But some of it may not be there, and I want you to be up to schedule on where we're at. Today, we're going to enter into the book of Philippians, and we're going to close out this passage. And uh, I, can I say that I'm sad to finish the book of Philippians, I have enjoyed this book, preaching through this book as much as I have enjoyed preaching through any section of scripture in a long time. It is just a great passage to remind us of the things that we need to do if we want to be a happy, prevailing, successful church in our community. You know, and it, what I love about Paul is he's been so plain spoken. And if you deal with the text, you have to be plain spoken too. And there's been a lot of challenges thrown out there to you guys from this passage and from to me too. And, and it really challenged me. It's challenged me in my personal life, my personal walk, and, and in my pastoral ministry. I've benefited from studying what Paul has had to say to the church. And can I tell you from my experience with the book of Philippians, I'm a happier church member. And I hope you are too. And I think if you're applying what you're learning from Paul, you will be. Today we come to the conclusion, which you know when you come to the uh, conclusion of one of Paul's letters, it's really written as a greeting. And, uh, you know, it's a powerful, important, and applicable greeting uh, for us to learn from. Just verse 21, 20, 21, 22, and 23, four short verses the kind of stuff that a lot of times you would overlook and, and not even think about how you would apply it to your life. But this passage is powerful. Speaking to the saints. Listen to what he says, verse 20. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. He says, greet every saint in Christ Jesus. The brothers who are with me greet you. Uh, and all the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. You know, the first seems to be a personal greeting from Paul to all the saints in Christ Jesus. And the second greeting from a group of people who Paul identifies as the brothers who are with me. You know, his close friends, his colleagues. And then the final uh, part is that all the saints, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. What's that tell you? That Paul's been on the ground in this Roman prison leading Romans to Christ. You know, people of Caesar's household, people of the emperor's household, Paul's been reaching for Christ. This is a bold, evangelistic, courageous, 
believer. What a great example for you and I right here in this final conclusion to the letter. And the theme of this letter from the book of Philippians is found in the familiar but often misunderstood word saint. You know, the title of today's uh, lesson is what? Joy in a life set apart for Christ. What's that tell you? There's a lot, that title tells you a lot. There's joy when you live your life differently from other people. There's joy when you live your life differently from a non-believer. There's joy when you live your life from a, a people who are satisfied in their sin. There's joy when you live your life set apart for Christ. When you decide to take on the mind of Christ, the heart of Christ, the attitude of Christ, the actions of Christ. When you make a decision to live for Christ, there is joy. And when a church makes that decision, you have a happy church talking to the saints. You know, John MacArthur, I studied this because I used to have, let me tell you, I used to have a lot of trouble. I used, I used to go uh, uh, to church sometimes with uh, my neighbor in Lynchburg who pastored a sort of a more charismatic church. And they threw the word saint around so often, so much. Everybody was a saint. Saint this, a saint that, brother saint, sister saint. Everybody is saint. And I, I, that was new to me. That was a new experience. I never heard the word saint used so uh, freely. And it troubled me. So I've, I've done some study on the word saint. And John MacArthur, he, he explains how the saint, the word saint has drifted from its New Testament meaning, has been loaded down with all sorts of culture and religious baggage. He did some, the term saint uh, has a holier than thou connotation. You know, they would call themselves a saint, uh, uh, and people would say, well, they sound arrogant and boastful and egotistical and proud, and that's where I, that's the way I perceived it. I thought, man, these are all these people are awful boastful in their walk with the Lord. Are they really saying they're they've achieved something, that they're that they're perfect in their walk, that they're better than other any other believer? You know, other people see the word saint as those who've done remarkable things for the good of humanity. You know, you think, you know, that uh, Mother Teresa has been uh, uh, set apart by the Catholic Church as a saint. Pope John Paul II has uh, been set apart by the church as a saint, the Catholic Church, because of the remarkable things they did for humanity during their time on earth to others the term, i'm going to talk just more about that in just a minute the other term others uh, others see the term saint conjuring up the image of gaunt ethereal figures etched in a stained glass window of a cathedral you know that's where they view the saints and he writes about how much macarthur writes about how much of the confusion about saints stems from the teaching of the Roman Catholic Church because a saint in the Roman Catholic Church is someone who, because of their exemplary virtue, their merit, their devotion, uh, their religious achievement, accomplishments, have been uh, canonized. They've been set apart, recognized by the church as a saint. But here's what I know. Here's what I've learned. And here's why I'm now comfortable calling even referring to myself, imperfect as I am, a saint. And to you, a saint. And to all believers in the church, a saint. A right understanding of those who Paul calls saints is divine by Scripture and can be only rightly interpreted by the text when you study the language. Paul, when he says the word saint, he says about individuals the word agios. And when he says the word saint about groups of people, he calls them agioi, plural. And the term translated means set apart ones, sanctified ones, and perhaps best, holy ones. Let me ask you something. Who are those who are set apart for Christ? These guys are set apart for Christ. You giving your life to Christ? Yes. You've given your life to Christ? Yes. You giving your life to Christ? Yes. You giving your life to Christ? Yes. Carrie's giving her life to Christ. Dr. Smith giving his life to Christ. Bailey's giving her life to Christ. Guess what? They're set apart for Christ. They're saints. 
They're looked upon by God and Jesus Christ as holy ones. And they're looked that way through the redeemed. Uh, they're bought, they're purchased with the blood of Christ. And we should live our life as set-apart ones. And what are the ones who are set-apart ones supposed to do? He tells us in this text what our life is supposed to look like. And in the verse, first part of the verse, he says in verse 20, To God and Father, to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Will you read that verse with me? To God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. You know what saints do? People who have their life set apart for Christ. You know what they do? They praise God. Their lifestyle is about praising God. Praising God is at the core of their identity. They live their life for the glory of God. They live their life so that God would be praised. You know, in Psalm 145, verse 2, David says, I will exalt you, my King and God, and I will bless your name forever and ever. He says, every day, every day, every day. He only says it one time, but I'm emphasizing it. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. And he goes on, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. Let me ask you, church, do you Praise God every day, regardless of what the circumstance is. You get up in the morning, go out to the car, and the battery's dead, and, and, and it doesn't start. And, and you know, do you, you get mad or you say, "Hey, God's in control of this situation." You know, you get up on a, you get you get out of your checking account, and you're going through the monthly balance, and it's all doggone, I'm I've come up short this month. Praise God, you know, <laughs> you know. Uh, you know, do you find out, you, you, you get, get, think about, you, you could be getting the, the old pink slip at the job. You ever got one of those? You know, pink slip at a job, that's a bad thing. That means your days are short, you know. You're going to be in the unemployment line. God says praise him in every circumstance. And here's what I know, church. We have a lot of bad days. Don't we? anybody have a bad day this week? Amen. Some people said amen. A lot of little kids raise their hand. Bad day. Bad day this week. Anybody that's had a flat, bad week? Hey. But guess what this passage teaches? I will bless you and I will praise you every day. If you're a saint, if you're a set apart one, and you know, you're living your life set apart for Jesus Christ, then praise ought to be part of your life each day. And every day. And I love the way Psalm, he comes in in Psalm 115, 18. And he says, I, he says, we will bless the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. It says, it says, it says, slow down. It's as if the psalmist is saying, if you haven't given God sufficient praise in the past, that's okay. You repent of that and you say, I will bless the Lord from this time forth and evermore. So I, I don't know where you're at, see. I don't know where you're at. I don't know how your heart is. I don't know where your attitude's at. I don't know if you're the kind of person you're set apart for Christ and, and you're constantly, without ceasing, praising God and that's a, a, at the core of your identity or if you're struggling with this situation. But here's what I know. If you're not praising God every day, you can come like the psalmist and say, Today, today I will begin to praise the Lord. I will look at my circumstances with joy. I will count them as a blessing. I will realize God is in control. I will realize he has a purpose in all things. That whatever God is doing in my life, he's drawing me closer to him. He's teaching me something. And I will give him praise. You know, I love. I want to talk to you about praise. Some in a corporate setting, some in a private setting. The Bible teaches seven types of praise. Praise that can happen at home, praise that can happen at work, praise that happen in a car, or praise that can happen in our worship service. You know, uh, we know that the lifestyle and worship praise is much more than just songs 
that we sing or even the motions we go through at our worship gathering. And that being said, you need to learn these expressions of worship, these different types of praise. And realize that they're just not attitudes and postures of the body, but they're attitudes and postures of the heart. Seven words used in the Old Testament to describe praise. The first is yada, and it means to show reverence, to praise with extended hands. You know, the word picture associated with the root word, a type of praise is like a shooting an arrow or throwing a rock. And it really means standing before the Lord with your hands up before him in total surrender. Total surrender. Total surrender. Picture a child. Picture a child. Small child. And they've got their hands up lifted to you. Mommy. Mommy. Daddy. Daddy. What are they doing? They're begging you, beseeching you to pick you up and hold them securely. Is there anything wrong with you and I as good old conservative Southern Baptist standing before our Lord with our arms praised up and saying, God, my life is a total surrender to you. I give you praise. Change my heart. Seek my heart. Know my ways. See if there's any unclean thing about me. I surrender my life to you. I want my life to be different. I surrender to the agreement of this song. I surrender to the agreement of this word. Shouldn't we as believers in Jesus Christ uh, who are biblical in our practice, shouldn't we be comfortable raising our hands and total surrender to the Lord in praise? I say amen, we should. Whether you do it in your car, whether you do it in your home, whether you do it in this worship gathering. There's another word, similar word, tada. The word is very similar to yada, but it has a slightly different meaning. It means to show agreement with the extended right hand. You know, how do we sometimes show agreement? We extend our right hand to our friend and we'll shake that hand. What's wrong with the believer standing before the Lord? And, and, and like Psalm 50, 23, it says, The one who offers thanksgiving as a sacrifice glorifies me. The one who orders his way rightly, I will show the salvation of God standing before the Lord and praise. As you sing one of these songs, you know, and it testifies, it speaks to your heart, and, 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 and you agree with it, and, and you know, uh, I'm washing the blood. You know, and yes, amen, I agree, I'm washing the blood. Victory in Jesus, hallelujah, I, I agree. What's wrong with standing before the Lord with your right hand lifted in agreement to what you're testifying with your heart and your mouth? The Old Testament says absolutely nothing. That's the way the saints worship. There's the word barak. It's a type of praise where we, we commonly see around the altar. It means to kneel down. To bow low is a sign of adoration. You see, not everything is lifted up. And, you know, sometimes people see this is showy and this is, uh, you know, irreverent. But we can bow down and we see that as, as acceptable praise. It's all acceptable praise. You know, Psalm 95, 6 is, Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. There may be moments... There may be moments in our worship service where you feel like, you know, I'm sitting here, I'm standing here, and I'm, I really need to be in a lower posture before the Lord. He's blessed me this week, and I need to get on my face and give him praise. Let me tell you, don't you dare be ashamed to walk forward and put your face at the altar and give God praise right there. Hey, and guess what? People might see you do it. Don't worry about it. That's what I say. That's what I say. As I have studied these passages, I'm growing you know, in, in my, uh, here's what I'm growing in. I'm going to tell you just like I think. I'm growing in, I don't care what people think. I care what the Lord says is right and what the Lord thinks. And it's re releasing me and making my relationship with God so much stronger. Just to obey Him. You know, can I tell you all the years I've sat? In a church, knowing the biblical model for worship, and just sat there and worshiped in the, not the biblical model for worship, but the Baptist 
model for worship and knew that I was grieving the Holy Spirit of the Lord. And I think with learning the biblical model and practicing the biblical model, there is some release. Release to allow God to work in your life. There's another word. It's called tell Hilah. The type of praise is singing, but not, it's not any type of singing. It's the singing that bubbles up from our heart. It's the type of singing that, that just comes from unrehearsed and unprepared. Just You're just ready to sing. Sing, um, you know, sing joyful songs to the Lord. Singing is a very important part of our praise. And I've met people who, uh, and, I, and, I said, and I said, I talked to a guy not too long ago. I led him to Christ. And, and he says, I don't understand some of this standing up and sitting down and all that singing. I don't sing. And I'm thinking, dude, that's because you've not been a believer and you've not had anything to sing about yet. And your life is about to change. Because you're going to have things to sing about and rejoice about and maybe clap your hands about and get excited about because God is about to do a work in your life and all you're going to be able to do is give him praise. You know. There's zamar. It literally means to pluck the strings, to celebrate in song with music. Probably the most common form of praise we do. We, you know, we, uh, we love our, you know, there are churches who won't, Pluck the strings. There are churches who absolutely refuse to have an instrument and worship. And I understand that. It's a biblical model of worship. And they just didn't worship with organs. They worshiped with, they didn't, they didn't even own a piano. They worshiped with cymbals and drums and all kinds of stringed instruments. They said, you read the Old Testament, read like Psalm 150. They come clanging the cymbals before the Lord. You know, what's that tell me? God loves when his people use their gifts and their talents done in the right heart with the right attitude and worship. God loves to hear the instruments. And then there's halal. I don't see new people, any two people uh, in this church or any other white church I've ever been in, but I've seen in some black church, halal. Uh, it come, means to be clamorously foolish before the Lord. It's the description of letting yourself go. It's what David did when the Ark of the Covenant was returned. Remember the text says he danced before the Lord. Can I tell you, we, at my, in my family, we might not dance before the Lord in First Baptist Church, but you put us in our house. <laughs> hey, that's some dancing before the Lord that goes on in my house. You know. Uh, it's not just about dancing. It's about the overflow that comes out of your heart. You know, what happens when you hear a little music? You almost can't control yourself, you know. You start getting the beat, you know, clapping your hands, shaking your head, you know, you're getting the feel. You can't control yourself. And sometimes that's the same thing it is when God's doing something in your life. When God is giving you blessing upon blessing upon blessing, and you're realizing that you're a saved sinner, saved by the grace of God, and, and you just can't, you just remember we talked about last week, counting your blessings, you counting your blessings, you count, it's like the beat of the music, and man, you can't control yourself anymore, and you just want to dance before the Lord, you know, it's in that heart, it's in the expression of your words, it's the expression of your life, it's in the expression of your attitude, you know, and that's where we need to be, people who are not afraid to practice Praising God. Church, let me tell you, don't be a grumbler. Don't be a complainer. A happy church, a happy believer is a believer who's set apart for Christ. And being set apart for Christ means that praising God is the core of your identity. It's who you are. You're a person that gives him praise. Second thing I read in this passage is this, greet every saint in Christ Jesus. And I'm going to focus on the word saint here. You know uh, Focus on the word saint. Saint is 
hagias comes from the word holy, you know. Uh, greet every holy one in Christ Jesus. And I, I read this phrase in a book. Uh, Shane, it's in that book I gave you this morning, bud. Uh, a book called The Pastor Justification, Applying the Work of Christ in Your Life and Ministry. Here's what, this, here's what the quote is. We do not pursue holiness as the means of salvation. We pursue holiness as the fruit of our salvation. So here's what the point you need to learn is. Uh, practicing godliness is part of your life. If you've given your life to Christ, Practicing godliness. You can say holiness. It's part of your life. And here's, you get to this verse right here, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. It says, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing. It is a gift of God and not a result of works so that no one may boast. Listen, you're not going to be a holy enough person to earn your way into heaven. But when you're saved and God looks upon you as holy, that's the way you should absolutely strive with all your heart to live. And I'm convinced, church, I am convinced, as I am convinced about anything else, I'm convinced about this. There are too many believers that are not living set-apart lives. You want to know why we have problems in our churches? Believers who aren't living set-apart lives. They're not living their life set-apart for Christ. They're living their life set-apart for who? Self. Let me tell you, when old Kev's the meanest and ugliest, when he's not thinking about Jesus, he's thinking about Kevin. When he's not thinking about the will of God, he's thinking about the will of me. Anybody ever feel that way, you know? Put the old will of me over the will of God? Yes, we do. Yes, we all do. And that's something that we need to repent of because that's not holiness. That's worldliness. You know, set apart. You know, we need to be set apart. How do we need to be set apart? In our language. We need to be set apart in our language. Uh, you know, our language needs to be pure. Uh, the things we put into our body need to be pure. The things we think about need to be pure. You know, the things we the desire thing to be needs to be pure. The things we say need to be pure. The things we desire needs to be pure. It means, means our, like you might say, uh, no foul language. That's what the Bible says, no foul language. You know, uh, you know, some of you guys, you want to debate this, but the Bible says, you know, you know, drinking, drunkenness is a sin. You know, lust is a sin. Selfishness is a sin. Gossip is a sin. And get this, personal, personal ambition. Desiring your own will over the will of God is a sin. We're to live. John 17, 14, 15 says this. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world. The world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. And then he said this. I'm not asking that you take them out of the world but that you keep them from the evil one. He's telling us, hey guys, you're believers in Jesus Christ. You're set apart from me, but I'm not going to take you out of the world. You're going to stay in the world. I'm not going to ask the Father to take you out. I'm going to ask him to leave you in. I'm going to ask him that while he leaves you in, that he keeps you separate from the evil one. You and I are giving a mandate to live in this world, not, uh, it would live in the world, but not of the world. You know, believers in Jesus Christ we're here. We're going to be here. We can't be taken out. We can't isolate ourselves. Why is that? Because we are to be the light in the darkness. Carrie tells me the story about a lady she heard telling about her daughter. And I, I may get it wrong. I'm trying my best to get it right. But she, she says, Mommy, take me to Walmart so I can let my light shine in the darkness. You know, here, and here's what I know. Believer, you're called to let your light shine in the darkness. Well, you remember that old song? Uh, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Remember that? How many of you know that? This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. You know, and then it gets that part, hide it under a bushel. No, I'm going to let it shine. Hey. Here's what I'm afraid of. There's too many of us here today 
that are hiding our lights under bushels by not living holy and set apart lives. You know what I'm talking about? You know, our conversation is conversation of the world, not of Christ. Our desires are the desires of the world, not of Christ. Can I challenge you today to take that bushel and pitch it in the trash? Let your light shine. Live you a holy life. Shine your light in the darkness. You think there's any darkness in the city of Clinton? Sure there is. Is there any darkness in your family? I bet so. Is there any darkness in your home that needs to see the light? Could be. And guess what? If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you've got the light of the world living inside of you. Let it shine. Number three in this passage, I see the brothers, verse 21 and 22, the brothers who are with me greet you, all the saints greet you, especially those of Caesar's household. Man, he's talking about a whole bunch of people here. He's talking about the brothers who are with me. You know, whenever or wherever Paul went, he was surrounded by other believers. He never went anywhere alone. He says, all the saints greet you. He's talking about all those who, people who are the, uh, the believers, probably Gentile believers or maybe Jewish believers. Uh, let me say, Jewish believers who were lived in Rome at the time. And then all those of Caesar's household. You know, it's a whole other group of saints that he referred to. And you know, when you put them all together, what you got is a great big old church. It's about all the saints gathered together in one great big old kingdom of God church. And here's what I know. Those of us who live a life set apart for Christ, we should be involved heavily in a church, participating in fellowship with other believers is essential for those who are set apart in Christ. Why is that? Well, there's some benefits to biblical fellowship. Number one, worshiping with your church family helps you focus on God. You know, uh, I know there's a passage in the Bible that says, uh, bad company corrupts good character. Remember that? Bad company corrupts good character. But what happens when you surround yourself with other believers? You know, Christian fellowship is two-dimensional. It has to be vertical before it can be horizontal. It must, we must know the reality of the fellowship with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ, before we can know the reality and uh, fellowship with each other and our common relationship with God. Worshiping with your church family helps you Focus on God. You know, uh, worshiping with your church family helps you face life's problems. I have a favorite verse that I believe in, and I believe I believe when the church is doing what it ought to do, it is the absolute best institution, best organization, best organism in the world. Hebrews chapter ten describes what fellowship in the church ought to look like. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 through 24. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, opened up through the curtain that is the body, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and full assurance, having faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from guilty conscience, and having our bodies washed in the pure water. That are those people who are in the church. And then he says, let us hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Do you know that you as a church have a responsibility to spur other believers on towards love and good deeds. What does spur mean? Motivate, encourage, fire up. And from time to time, you may need to give your, uh, your, your brother and sister Christ a good kick in the seat of pants to keep them in fellowship with the Lord. Here's what I know, church. The Christian life is not a solo act. We draw strength from one another. That's called biblical 
fellowship. It's like this old illustration. Maybe you've heard about how this uh, guy takes a big campfire and he, he's got the coals burning and the coals are hot and they're hot, you know, they're red hot and, you know, the flames are coming up and he takes a coal out. And this is a coal. He takes his coal and he sets it away from the fire. And what eventually happens to this, this coal that was red hot when it was up in the middle of the fire? It died out. It'll be turned uh, completely cold, right? You, you know, if your fire burns all night, you set this one out to the side, it's going to be uh, icy cold. You can pick it up and rub it all over your skin. It won't bother you at all, right? What happens when you pick it up and put it back in the fire? It gets hot again. It gets hot again. Here's what I know. Here's what I know. I'm going to come down here. I got to tell you what I know. It's important. Here's important. I've been living with my wife. We, we, we got married in 1990. It's 23 years. Okay? And there are times, hey, we in the fire. You see what I'm saying? Same house. We live in the same house. And we're in the fire. And guess what? There are times when mad, fussing, conflict, Guess we get apart. We get apart. No fire. No fire. You see what I'm saying? But what happens? Because we love each other. We always end up, I'm going to tell you this, we always end up back in the fire. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Hey, listen, church. I'm telling you right now about biblical fellowship. And what I'm telling you is, you can be sitting here, right here in this room, saying, I go to church. I'm there every Sunday. I go to Sunday school. I sing in the choir. I teach a class. And, dude, you can be ice cold because you can be out of fellowship. You know, because let me tell you something. There's been times when I've been the pastor. And uh, I've been ice cold in the fellowship. You got to be engaged. That's what I'm telling you. You can't just show up. You've got to be engaged. You've got to be invested. And you've got to allow other people to invest in you. And here's what I'm saying. Maybe you've been hurt. and You've taken yourself out of the fire. Take yourself out of the fire. And you know in your heart, you're not engaged in that church. You're not drawing any strength from that church. You're not giving any strength to that church. You're just going and showing up. Can I challenge you today to follow the principle of participating in fellowship with other believers? Get yourself involved. You know, get yourself involved. Get some people that are, can encourage you and surround yourself with you. Get back in the fire. Get back on fire and do something for Christ. Can you do that? And then finally in this passage, he talks about how, is it right there on your phone? He says, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Last thing on the next slide, Wade. The purpose of your existence is the grace of God. If you're set apart for Christ, the reason you're alive is the grace of God. What is the grace of God? Unmerited favor. Something you didn't deserve that God gave you. Grace. You wouldn't be sitting here today if Jesus Christ hadn't given up the throne in heaven, left the right hand of the Father, went to earth, you know, what's John 1, 14? The, uh, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. He dwelt among us for one, pers- one reason, to communicate the gospel that, he, that represented in his body, in his activity, the life, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the good news to men, the grace of God. You wouldn't be sitting here without the grace of God. Your life should be so wrapped up in the grace of God, living in the grace of God, and guess what? Talking about the grace of God. When's the last time you told somebody about the good news, the grace of God, 
the gospel about how Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone is sufficient. When's the last time you told somebody that there's no other name given under heaven by which we must be saved except for the name of Jesus? Your whole life, see, should be consumed in the grace of God. That's what a life set apart for Christ is. A life set apart for Christ. Listen, you got to work 40 hours, 60 hours, 70 hours, 80 hours a week. And it's easy to get your life consumed up in, you know, preparing sermons, you know, counseling, uh, dealing with other people's issues, you know. Uh, it's easy to get caught up in, you know, is this piece of equipment going to work when I take it out to the field and worried over that stress? It's easy to get caught up in trying to, you know, make a living and earn, uh, raise children. It's easy to get caught up in whatever our studies are or our job is. But you got to remember the first thing about you is you're a believer in Jesus Christ. And this passage teaches you that when God looks down upon you from his throne in heaven, he sees you as one who is holy, one who is set apart. And as one who is set apart, he expects certain things from you. And one of those things is that you live your life for the purpose of the grace of God. You're all about the grace of God. Living out the grace of God living in the grace of God, and sharing the grace of God. Let's think about those things as we approach our time of invitation. Maybe this morning you're going to, I want you to think about this. Have you been faithful in praising God every day, regardless of the situation? You know, everybody grumbles and complains once in a while, but come on now. Are you really serious about praising God? Do you practice holiness? You know, you try to live a holy, clean life. Don't you think if, as God, if God sees you as holy, you should strive to live as holy in all that you do? And, you know, what about being in fellowship with the other believers? You know, are you in fellowship or are you out of fellowship? I say, are you in church? With, but I'm talking about, are you in fellowship? Fellowship. Encouraging one another, spurring one another towards love and good deeds involved in the lives of the people of the church are you all about the grace of god is that the number one concern in your life if it's not i invite you today to come to the altar ask god to change your heart do something different in your life help you to live the life as he sees you holy and set apart. And I promise you, church, we've been in this series of the book of Philippians now for months. And I promise you, if you'll look back over all these notes and you'll read back through this book and you'll apply this book, that you will have a overwhelmingly happy, Father God, I thank you for our time together this morning. And I thank you, first of all, for a sinless offering sent to the cross to bear our sins. And through the shed blood of Jesus Christ and our confession in him as our Lord and Savior, that you see us as holy ones set apart for you. Lord, I thank you very much for the believers here this morning who've grasped that reality and they strive to the best of their ability to live a life set apart. Praising you, practicing holiness, participating in fellowship, and they see their purpose is in the glory of God. But maybe there's some here who are struggling with one or all of these issues. And Lord, I pray that you help us to deal with that today as individuals and as a church. Help us, Lord, to be people who do exactly what this lesson teaches. Praise and practice holiness and fellowship and living in your glory. Lord, maybe there's someone here today who realizes for the very first time that I'm not set apart. 
I've never given my life to Christ. And I need to do that. And I need to do it right now. I need to do it immediately. I don't want to leave here today without giving my life to Christ. And then I want to live just exactly like the pastor said those Philippians lived. Set apart for Christ. Speak to our hearts. Search our hearts. Know if there's anything in our hearts that needs to change. And help us to apply this word so that we have a happy church that can shine our light into the darkness of our world and lead people to Christ and build your kingdom. It's in your name we pray. Amen. If you would stand with me, please.